Good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Victor Robledo. I'm the founding director of Startup Grind Monterey Bay. Welcome. Startup Grind Monterey Bay started as an idea. Two friends came together from this idea. With their sheer passion, their will, and their unrelentless pursuit of creating something out of an idea, we came together. Thank you to CSUMB and the Institute for Economic Development for your sponsorship. I really appreciate it. I have to be honest with you guys. I ran uphill down from Valley Hall. I'm actually a student here as well. I'm majoring in collaborative health and human services with a public administration major. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm honored. Without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy this video. The eloquent design of one wheel was invented by a man that understood the design process, the methodologies of creating a product from his initial idea. It gave me great honor, and I'm proud to introduce to you Kyle Dorthen, the founder and CEO of Future Motion Inc., and the inventor of one wheel. Everybody, please stand up and give him a round of applause. Welcome. Have a seat. That was quite an entrance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's a good, good excuse, good way to make an entrance. <laughs> Welcome to the Monterey Bay. Huh? Is this your first time in the area? Uh, well, so we're based in uh, Santa Cruz, so um, just the other side of the bay. But that's the first time. Uh, my first time on the campus here. It's beautiful. It's a great new building. 
So here at Startup Grind, we want to start off by getting to know you. Also give the audience an opportunity to get to know you. I want to start off by asking you, where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in Calgary, Canada, which is near the Canadian Rockies. And so uh, I grew up, I was a tinkerer, an inventor, you know, I was noodling with the Lego sets and electronic kits and taking stuff apart that didn't go back together and, um, you know, snowboarding in the Canadian Rockies in the winter. And then um, I came to California for um, t- to study. Uh, I studied engineering at Stanford. Um, you know, first, I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, like I have a lot of interests, you know, and so... I studied bioengineering and computer science and ultimately mechanical engineering um, and got a, got a master's from Stanford um, and then kind of launched my career after that. As you were growing up, was there a specific person that influenced you in the tinkering <laughs> to explore, to create? Was it a family member that was an entrepreneur as well? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think most people can point to some amazing mentors that they had. And uh, I, uh, as part of my school where I went to elementary school, one thing they did was they had each student get a mentor from industry, basically. And um, my mentor was this guy who built um, robots because I was really into robots when I was a kid and kind of ahead of the curve. Robots are a big deal right now in the entrepreneurial world. But, uh, you know, when I was in, in elementary school, I was always thinking about robots. And so... This guy worked at the um, Research Council, which is like a federally funded research group in Canada. And uh, he was building, you know, those huge dump trucks they have for like uh, mining and off-road stuff. He was actually making those remote control, which I thought was so cool as a a kid. And he showed me around his lab and this kind of thing. Um, But also, you know, thinking back about the entrepreneurial bug, um, you know, both my grandfathers, I, um, if you know, in today's lingo, you'd say they were entrepreneurs. Like they, they wouldn't probably use that word, but they started businesses. Um, you know, my grandfather, my mom's side, uh, started a camera camera shop. Uh, you know, knew that people were going to get into like these little Kodak cameras and Polaroid cameras, and um, grew that, and then sold that business, um, and you know, kind of retired at that point. So it's definitely in the blood. <laughs> So as you were growing up, um, you mentioned high school. Was there an experience in high school that influenced you to continue on the entrepreneurial path? Uh, yeah, in, in high school, um, you know, uh, well, there were a couple things. One, I was already an entrepreneur. So my buddy and I had started a web design company because this was like 19, you know, 98, 99, and like the web was starting to happen. And I was actually just uh, back home last week and looking through some old papers and stuff that are kicking around my parents' house. And we had like our original brochure, you know, about how like the internet was going to be a big thing and like you should get on board now and all this stuff. Um, so, you know, my buddy and I were doing that and doing uh, web consulting and hosting and stuff like that. Um, and then I also did actually a summer program in um, like, so they, they call it like science, math, and entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a Canadian program called Shad, Shad Valley. And uh, really cool. And they just brought in um, speakers, you know, successful entrepreneurs, and they varied um, super widely. I remember this one guy, um, have you ever seen Eve's Veggie Cuisine? They make like veggie dogs and like veggie sausage and stuff like that. Well, anyway, he came up with this idea while he was riding his bicycle across Canada. And he's like, you know, I want to do this. Um, and now it's like a multi, multi million dollar company and super successful. So it's kind of like, you know, whatever idea you have, if yeah. you chase it, you can be successful with it. So where did the idea come about for you to actually attend Stanford? Um, where did that idea come about? Well, uh, I guess so it's like the 90s, you know, the tech, the first tech bubble is really heating up. And I was always reading Wired Magazine, you know, and Wired Magazine was always talking about like Palo Alto and Silicon Valley and all this stuff. I was like, wow. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I, was, uh, I did pretty well in school and, you know, applied to Stanford and it ended up getting in and ended up actually getting, there's this uh, like 90 something year old um, Canadian woman who was like class of 1935 or something. And she had endowed a scholarship for one Canadian student per year. And so I ended up getting that, which is awesome. And let me yeah. go there and, and study, which is sweet. What did you actually study at Stanford for your undergrad? So my undergrad, uh, they had a program where you could design your own major um, by picking classes in different departments and then sort of um, writing an essay that explained how they fit together to make like a, um, 
you know, a, a coherent major. And so mine was in uh, neuroengineering. So the study of neuroscience and the brain, and then sort of like um, electrical and computer engineering. And now, I mean, at the time, nobody had really heard the word neuroengineering. And now there's actually like, you can get a PhD in neuroengineering from wow. Stanford, MIT, and places like that. Because um, I was really interested in how you could use like engineering methods to study the brain, and then also how the the way the brain works could inspire the way that we could engineer things. Um, wow. And uh, so even like one wheel, it's really, you know, it has sensors, it has sort of thinking, you know, computation, and then it has actuators. And that's the way, you know, the, the brain works. Part of our brain is responsible for like sensing through vision and hearing and stuff like that. Part of it is processing. And then part of it is figuring out, calculating, like, how do I fire these muscles in the right sequence so that, you know, you can move your arms smoothly like that. Um, so, you know, I put like, I, I put people, I put myself in like the MRI imaging machines, like I lost pictures <laughs> of my brain and stuff like that when I was studying there. So neuroengineering and mechanical engineering. Yeah. So I got the undergrad degree in neuroengineering and I thought, well, nobody even knows what this word means. So he's going to hire me. So I figured if I did a, a master's in mechanical, people would be like, oh yeah, mechanical engineers. Yeah. We're, we're hiring mechanical engineers. You should come work for us. <laughs> so you, you design... <laughs> your own undergrad, essentially. That design skill set that you possess, you had it before you acquired the neuroengineering degree, correct? Did that degree help you to improve on your design capabilities? Yeah, you know, my interest in design um, kind of developed a little bit later. I mean, I think for me, um, you know, making things, inventing, you know, that's that had always been part of who I was, you know, talk about building stuff out of Lego when I was a kid and stuff like that. But uh, design, you know, and, and that term really, really came later, it came towards like the end of my studies where, um, you know, I got involved with like the Stanford product design program and um, uh, doing actually the, this class where you, um, you, uh, you know, companies sponsor the class and each group of students works for a company and does, um, you know, a project for that company. And we ended up working for Volkswagen um, and building this really cool thing um, where you could like wave your hand around um, like over the gear shift and you could actually control your stereo and like roll the windows up and down like um, with a sort of gestural interface. Um, and that was to me so cool and figuring out how we would, like integrated the car and the human factors of how it would work. And, um, you know, that's really where I got the, the design bug and uh, then, you know, decided that uh, when I graduated, you know, I really wanted to do something design related. So I ended up going to IDEO and uh, working as a designer there for a number of years. Wow. So that was your first job after your... your yeah, it was my first job. And I, I, you know, it's like across the street from Stanford pretty much. So I didn't make it very far. <laughs> yeah. And I, I worked there for eight years, you know, started out as an intern. Okay. I saw like this jacket they gave me when I was an intern. <laughs> uh, rose up through like mechanical engineer, senior mechanical engineer, and then project manager, um, so I spent like the last four years there managing basically creative teams of people that were creating new things. And that was, that was really fun. <laughs> so when you were creating, uh, you mentioned you were inside of a lab environment. How essential was the lab experience in helping you figure out how to bring people together to create things? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, for, for me, what I do now as a startup CEO is all about bringing great people together, you know, and um, sort of pointing them in a direction, but then letting them do what they do best. And um, at, at IDEO, like at, at first when I started, I was I was the doer, like I was the one doing the engineering um, and, uh, you know, spinning CAD and designing stuff and working in the machine shop, building stuff. Um, but, you know, at some point, um, you know, you can have more influence by working with other people, right? And yeah. putting teams together um, and uh, and leading those teams. And so that was kind of the um, the path that I was on through there. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know your, your question about the lab. Like, yeah. I think having like a creative place where there is access to the tools you need yeah. to do whatever it is you do, um, you know, that that's always been important to me. So, 
you know, I always had like in, in my basement growing up, I had like toolboxes and stuff. And then, um, you know, after, after college, like I lived in these, you know, houses I shared with other guys and we always had these workshop garages, no cars ever fit in the garages because it was all <laughs> tools and stuff like that. Right. And we were all tinkering away on stuff. And, um, you know, now we have like our, our, um, own little machine shop at future motion and we're going to be expanding that. Um, and that's, that's really fun for me. How did future motion come about? Was it from you tinkering around in a garage with your yeah. buddies? How did that actually? Begin? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's really the classic like garage inventor story. So, um, you know, I had this idea that if you took, um, you know, a wheel like this and you use sensors to stabilize it and a motor, um, and you know, you could stand like this and, you know, lean forward to go forward, lean back to slow down, that, that would probably feel a lot like snowboarding on powder, which yeah. is, you know, having grown up near the Canadian Rockies, like one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. Um, and so the first prototype didn't look anything like this. Um, on, I think somewhere on our website, there's a picture of it, but it had like a big chain drive and these yeah. giant batteries and it weighed like over 50 pounds. <laughs> and um, it took me about a year to build the first one wheel prototype. Um, in my garage, you know, just with like a drill and like some basic tools and stuff like that. Um, and then, um, you know, I had this one friend in particular that was like, oh, can you build me one? Can you build me one? Like, I'll buy it from you. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, whatever, man, I'm just doing this for me. You know, it's just my hobby. Like I'm not, I'm not really turning this into a product or a yeah. business. Um, so time went on, I kept working at IDEO, um, which is you know, a really amazing place to work. And I was psyched to you know, help all these um, clients with designing their, you know, next generation products and that kind of stuff. Um, along the way, I helped start an electric bicycle company called Faraday Bikes. Um, they're based in San Francisco. They make a really nice electric bicycle where the batteries are integrated into the frame of the bike. Um, and so you, you can't even really tell by looking at it. That it's an e-bike. Um, and so uh, we, uh, I helped launch that company as a spin out from, from IDEO. So it's now its own its own firm based in San Francisco. Um, but I think launching that out really got me enthusiastic about this uh, world of personal transportation, you know, and, and the business that it's going to become. And because the technology is in these small vehicles, like the motors and the batteries and stuff like that, uh, as well as the sensors are getting, um, you know, much cheaper, much smaller. Um, it's really opening up these new form factors and solving the transportation problems that, you know, people have had for so long. Right. The, you know, the kind of last mile problem. How do you get around your campus? Like parking is difficult. Um, you don't really want to take a car. You want to take a bike, but your bike, where do you lock it? Yeah. You to take a skateboard, but what about the uphill? What about the, you know, dirt yeah. trail you got to ride down? <laughs> um, so, you know, the new technologies allow us to build totally new kinds of vehicles. And um, so I sort of heated the project up again after a while. And said, hey, you know, I really want to make it a lot more elegant than that first prototype. You know, I want to figure out how to put the motor in the hub of the wheel so that there's no chain, there's no belt, there's no gears. It's just like a very minimal, you know, one moving part kind of design. Um, and that turned out to be really hard. Yeah. <laughs> it took a couple of years to actually yeah. figure out how to do that. Um, and then, you know, once I had that prototype going and, you know, showed it to some people, I was kind of, you know, I've been at IDEO for eight years. And I thought... You know, it's, it's really cool helping other people do this, but, you know, I really want to see this idea that I have get out into the world. And um, for, for us, that meant um, launching a Kickstarter campaign, actually, okay. which is what we did next. So when you had the initial idea, right, you developed the prototype initially. How did you bring that idea together to actually go seek money, the funding? Yeah. Yeah, so for us, I mean, crowdfunding was really what enabled us to launch this as a product and a company um, because, you know, I, I knew that if we went and pitched investors, you know, when we just had a prototype, it was going to be really hard to get them to buy in. But I knew that when I showed it to people, to customers, they were super enthusiastic about it. So, um, you know, we decided to do a Kickstarter campaign. Um, so I took a leave of absence from IDEO. I said it's going to be somewhere between six months and forever, depending on how some stuff goes. Yeah. And, um, you know, evolved this, built, a, you know, made a really nice video, yeah. uh, put a Kickstarter campaign together and launched that in, in January of last year. Um, and so we launched Kickstarter uh, and um, 
and exhibited at CES in Las yeah. Vegas, like on, uh, on the same day, oh, which wow. was pretty crazy. Yeah. And you know, within 24 hours, we you know met our hundred thousand dollar goal, and nice. you know it was just like the craziness <laughs> has continued till today. <laughs> what type of advice can you give fellow entrepreneurs that are in this room in regards to when they have an idea? And to not give up, and also, how do they go about to pursue the team members and funding sources? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a really big question, right? It sort of depends on on what the entrepreneur's skill set is. Like my my core skill set was making things, so I could do the prototyping kind of myself originally. And now, you know, we've got a talented team of engineers that works on it, and I don't actually do much of that anymore. But um, you know, so for some people, they can build their own prototype. Maybe it's software, and they're a programmer. Maybe it's you know, product, they know how to tinker with that. But sometimes you don't, you know, you don't know how to actually make a prototype. I, I mean, I think a prototype is really important. And you, yeah. you shouldn't be out, like, raising money before you have a prototype and have figured out how to get enough people excited about it. Um, and, you know, I, I've... So I mentioned I ran, like, this web design firm when I was, like, 16, 17. Um, you know, and I've been involved with, like, some other entrepreneurial endeavors, too. Um, I was working on a company called LapView, which is um, a little wearable sensor that clips on your swim goggles and uh, counts your laps and some other analytics about your your swim. And in that, that was somebody else's idea. And he, um, you know, was a business guy, didn't have you know technical skills, but um, he, he got some students at the university where he was at to do a student project, um, build kind of the first prototype and. Then I saw that first prototype and said, hey, you know, we, we can do like way better than that. <laughs> like, yeah. We can, you know, get this thing um, be really small, really elegant. So I joined that team and, yeah. you know, we put that together and um, built the prototype. And, and that, you know, we got it to this nice point where it was designed and it was prototyped. But neither he nor I were like really ready to quit our day jobs to yeah. chase that. You know, it was, it was a cool thing, but we weren't ready to just like work as hard as you need to to turn an idea into a company so we just kind of let that go you know we have a patent maybe we'll like sell it off at some point but um you know it's it's interesting because to to really dive into building a whole company and a product and customer support uh you have to be pretty convinced that your idea is really worth um working that hard for so you were working with students um, established entrepreneur you had a project, right? Is that something that you could advise students that are in here to look out for entrepreneurs that are building things or just have an idea to somehow partner up with them or work on projects? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, yeah, people have really different skill sets and you should find people where, you know, your skill set complements theirs. And so, if, if, you know, if you're really good at spreadsheets, you know, find someone that's super creative, but, you know, yeah. can't run numbers and, you know, team up with them. Yeah. If you're, you know, good at making things, you know, find someone who has an idea, but no idea how to turn it into reality. And yeah. like those kind of, the chemistry is really key um, to, you know, launching new ideas into the world. Has there ever been a point through your design, your invention, that individuals were telling you, Man, Kyle, what are you thinking about? You're, you're <laughs> nuts, you know, in any specific idea? Have you ever had that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, people are always, um, you know, reacting to you in both, you know, positive and negative ways, right? And I think as, a, as an entrepreneur, like, you have to have courage to chase the idea. Like, you're doing something that doesn't exist yet, right? That's kind of the point. And so people don't really know whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Maybe you don't even really know if it's yeah. a good idea or a bad idea, but you kind of just need to keep marching it forward. Um, you know, when, when we launched the Kickstarter for this, um, like five people in the world had ever ridden the prototype. And it was kind of sketchy and it was kind of dangerous. And we were like, I don't know <laughs> if people are going to catch on, yeah. you know, are people going to think it's really... Um, really strange and, you know, uh, bizarre, or are they going to think it's really cool? Um, And, you know, as we move forward, um, overwhelmingly, people have thought it's really cool. (laughs) And we've got, like, some of the best board sports athletes in the world now, like, riding this thing and, um, you know, from, you know, Hawaii to South Africa to Tahoe um, and, you know, just uh, responding really well. But 
you know, had they ridden one of those first prototypes, they definitely would have thought it was super whack. I mean, you know, we had to advance technology and then build our crowd of sort of supporters and early adopters. And then, you know, it kind of snowballs from there. Did you start this with a, an idea on a napkin? You just had a spark of an idea? And you just <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. There's just like a sketch in a notebook yeah. uh, back from now about like seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it took, like I said, it took about a year to get to the first thing that someone could actually ride. And then, you know, a long time of evolving. And I think that was a little bit rare, um, you know, to spend, you know, basically like four, four years tinkering on it before, you know, crowdfunding or um, seeking any capital. Um, and that was uh, in this case because like the technology wasn't quite here yet when I started building those first prototypes. I had to wait for... Um, you know, the sensors that are in a, in a smartphone, those MEM sensors that measure the angles um, of your phone um, to really evolve. Like when I built the first prototype of this thing, I had one gyro, it cost about $70 for that one gyro. Now you can buy a tiny chip that has three gyros, three accelerometers, and costs about, you know, $2.50. Oh, wow. um, and, you know, that was because you know, the, the Wii came out and then the iPhone came out with a motion sensing and it really you know, advance that whole field. Yeah. Um, and then the motor technology as well. Like it, it sort of took the electric bicycle industry evolving um, kind of powerful small motors that we could then adapt into one wheel. So, wow. yeah, uh, <laughs> so sometimes you got to like wait for the world to catch up. Um, and then, you know, because I, I, I think you can definitely launch, launch a company too early or too late. Yeah. You know, if it's too early, you know, the technology's not there, the market's not ready for it. Um, if it's too late, you know, there's too many competitors already and it's, you know, really challenging for a small company to get, get a foothold. So, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, the surfing analogy where it's like if you paddle way ahead of the wave, it doesn't matter how hard you paddle, you're never going to catch it. And it, if you, you know, if you're too late, like, again, there's just no chance. you got to have that timing just right. And if you get it, then, you know, the market's going to be growing, um, technology's getting better, and you're just kind of riding that wave. You mentioned neuroengineering. Yeah. How do you see the world evolving with technology, specifically with your invention? Yeah, so the, the cool thing about building something that's based around digital technology is that that stuff just gets better and better every year, right? So, um, you know, we have about a 100 megahertz processor in here. It's like old technology now. Um, but, it, you know, it's really all we need to do um, uh, what, what we're doing here. Um, but, you know, every year they come out with faster, and better processors at the same cost as last yeah. year's, right? So we can add more capability um, to the product. Um, we also made the decision to make one wheel connect to an iPhone and Android app. Um, and so that allows us to, like, add capability and actually do wireless upgrades through the app. Um, so it'll upgrade your one wheel um, from your mobile app. Um, and that allows us to keep making the products that are already out in the field better over time. The battery technology is getting a lot better. Um, so that means that like our future products are going to go farther and faster. Um, you know, Tesla is investing in these huge factories, I'm sure you've heard of. Um, and, and lots of other people are too. So, um, you know, we made, uh, we basically um, design and control every aspect of our product except the battery because uh -huh. we know other people are working so hard to yeah. advance battery technology <laughs> that for us to dive into that would be you know uh, you know t too challenging but we get to just take advantage of their advances um, and, and just make the rest of the product really really good you recently had a partnership with a manufacturer correct um, yeah, so we have, you know, a couple of key, key partnerships um, that make it possible for us to build this, the partnership with our motor <laughs> supplier um, and the partnership with our, um, our manufacturer who actually puts it together. So the One Wheel product is built in California. It's built in San Jose. Wow. Uh, it was over at our factory this morning. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that partnership is, uh, you know, really rich. So our, our team is about 11 people in um, our design office in Santa Cruz, but uh, then there's 15 more people that work on the manufacturing line in San Jose and actually put each one wheel together. And that's like a whole other skill set that's really important um, in order to get this thing onto shelves. So are you still doing 
product building and venting, or are you shifting now to more of a, a leadership position within your company? Yeah, um, definitely, you know, have, have moved into much more of a leadership role. Um, but the sort of core of invention and product, you know, I'm, I'm a product CEO, right? There's different kinds of CEO. Some are focused on ops, some are focused on technology. Um, you know, I, I'm focused on product, right? And so I have some visions of how our future products need to be in order to succeed in the marketplace. And, you know, I'm building the engineering and marketing and the operations teams to be able to do that. Okay. At this point in time, I'd like to open it up to the audience members and see if you have any questions. Just raise your hand and we'll go ahead and call on you. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> when building a product, I know a lot of people are concerned about somebody stealing the idea. Do you have any good advice or encouraging experiences as to where if you just said, I'm going to build it and come <laughs> forward and not worry so much about patents and protecting it? And yeah, so, um, I mean, we, we've decided to definitely pursue patents and so. We have a you know pretty core utility patent that we filed for sort of several years ago now and is, is now issued. Um, you know we've got design patents, trademarks, um, international patents, all that kind of stuff because um, you know we, we, this is really our invention. And then now that we've showed people that it's really cool, uh, now you know there's other companies that could you know figure out how to build a, a copy of it essentially. So. Um, you know, we, we've decided, you know, not to go open source, something that we talked about early on, like, could we have a kit and open source, people could customize it more. Um, but for this particular product, um, it seemed like we needed to like, sort of hold on to it more closely. And I, I mean, my advice is just, you know, to file a provisional patent, um, you know, before you do any publicity or, you know, um, show, show the product publicly um, so that you can get that priority date and, doesn't really cost very much to do a provisional patent, um, but then it gives you a year to file a full patent if you decide you want to do that. Um, and if you decide not to, you know, you just kind of walk away from it. But um, yeah, any any other well, kind of instance, questions about that? Patent, did you intend or was more accidental when you filed it in relation to your product launch for instance? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, that's an interesting question because you kind of want to wait as long as possible, <laughs> but um, you don't want to run the risk of, you know, maybe somebody else is working on it. You don't know about it and they, you know, they could file it. So we filed our provisional like the day before uh, we showed at Maker Faire uh, in San Mateo because, um, you know, that constitutes public you know, showing of it. So, um, you know, there's definitely some games to play with, with that whole world. And uh, a lot of a lot of lawyers that can help you with that <laughs> at great expense, <laughs> but the, but the provisional doesn't need to cost very much. How many of these are selling in China without your patent? Um, not very many. Yeah, <laughs> not very many right now. Um, you know, will there in the future? Um, who knows? We have you know patents in in process in China and in many other markets. Um, and, you know, for us, uh, we're also really focused on uh, building a brand, right? So besides the technology, um, there's the brand, there's the whole ecosystem around the product that's really important too. So, um, you know, you can buy a, a smartphone that has like way better features than an iPhone for like 50 bucks at a lot of places in China, but, you know, Apple is still the most valuable company in the world. So, um, you know, there's, there's more to it than just you know, is somebody directly copying your product? That was my next question. So yeah. What about applications? Uh, I, I wasn't here when you started your presentation. I was on the phone call. Yeah. <laughs> what applications besides recreation? Are you looking so, you know, recreation and transportation are really our um, core focuses right now. And we're pretty focused on the consumer market. So definitely there are applications, um, you know, riding around factories, you know, uh, police forces, park rangers, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, we are, of course, living a little bit in the shadow of Segway, which showed, showed us a lot of things how not to do that. And so they really went after this B2B market. But then, you know, once you've got a bunch of like mall cops riding around, it's hard to then position it as like, this is a really cool product for young people. So, you know, we... We would love, you know, to sell some to mall cops at some point, but, you know, we're, that's down the road, you know, um, in, in terms of sort of, you know, ad addressing the market. Uh, I have a question. Um, so 
for the Kickstarter campaign, it's kind of two part. Um, how long did you spend working on the Kickstarter campaign before you actually launched? Because I mean, I know there's a lot yeah. of different factors <laughs> to take into consideration, and then also, uh, what was the final amount that you raised uh, yeah. for your Kickstarter campaign? So Kickstarter campaigns are pretty complicated, and if you are thinking of running one. First thing you need to do is go talk to like a bunch of other people that have successfully run them. Um, so it was my second Kickstarter because um, we did one for Faraday bikes as well. And um, so I kind of knew that the dynamics of what you need to do, what's important, what's not important. Um, so I um, spent about like four, four to five months getting the campaign designed. Um, that includes like making, uh, making the video, creating the actual Kickstarter page, setting up a website, um, you know, setting up a landing page uh, so that we already had like an email list of a couple thousand people we could blast out to the first day of the campaign, um, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, we ended up raising um, $630,000 in um, about three weeks. Wow. So wow. that was uh, kind of a life-changing moment. <laughs> um, but, you know, the... the Kickstarter campaigns have gotten, you know, much more sophisticated even since since we launched ours. So, you know, now it's not uncommon for a successful Kickstarter campaign to be spending a lot of money on online advertising, PR agencies, like all that kind of stuff to make this, you know, what seems like a grassroots thing um, actually hit, but there may be like a company behind it. Um, and, you know, that's uh, there's definitely ways to do it on the cheap, but you need to have your strategy of, like, how are people going to find out about this, right? And for us, one of the key parts of that strategy was, like I said, launching at CES on the same day that we launched the Kickstarter. So CES, you know, there's all these reporters and media people and hundreds of thousands of attendees, and it's just got a lot of energy. And people are used to seeing, like, new products launch there. And so for us, that was a, a really good spot where, you know, we had emailed, like, 25 um, newspapers and blogs and magazines before we launched and like none of them did anything. And then we went to CES, you know, and, and within, you know, a day we had a number of um, online press hits and it just started snowballing from there. And, you know, at CES we got, um, you know, on the MSNBC homepage and um, in some other pretty big press outlets that, um, you know, helped us get that kind of funding in the Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> Like your first sketch that you did of the idea to yeah. where you guys are now, what would you say was like the most difficult obstacle to get over? Like, was it getting funding? Was it kind of getting the first piece made? Was it reaching out to people? Like, what was the most difficult thing for your company? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think one of the difficult things is just how many things there are. Uh, you know, because uh, it's you know uh, we we push super hard to deliver the product. Um, as on time as possible. So we were about a uh, month and a half late on our Kickstarter, which is like totally on time by Kickstarter standards. <laughs> um, but, you know, we could have easily been a year late um, with the Faraday bike that we launched. Um, you know, that delivered like over a year after it had been, um, you know, promised to backers. And I didn't want to repeat that. I kind of learned from experience that, you know, the day your Kickstarter is done, like you need to run as fast as you can towards uh, production if you're doing a hardware product. So um, we, we did that. Um, you know, I think um, fun, like fundraising is always challenging, I think. Um, we actually ended up meeting the people that led a seed round investment in us uh, at CES. So you, you never know where you're going to meet investors. I think that's a, another important lesson. Um, you know, yeah, you might meet them at some mixer or you might just like, you know, have someone try your product and just be like, wow, this is amazing. Like, can I invest? So, um, you know, that's been uh, our story more than not. Any other questions? Can you pinpoint the, the moment or the decision or the instance that led you to leave your amazing job and amazing company and really take that risk to go out on your own? Yeah, I mean, I was a little reluctant to, to leave the, um, the job that I had at IDEO. I mean, it was in many ways um, my dream job, you know, and there were like free bagels and like <laughs> comp yoga. And it was really cool. But, um, you know, and, and great people to work with and, and really interesting work. But um, for me, I think it was realizing that um, for sure, you know, I had the skill set to help other people with their products. But 
now I wanted to really see one of my own ideas like grow and um, you know spread into the world, and that I was willing to like not get any more free bagels to uh, <laughs> go chase that opportunity. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> you mentioned um, battery technology. What are you seeing happening in battery technology? Because it's so key to many, many products out there. Um, well, there's a lot happening in battery technology. Um, you know, there's really um, a couple things. One is in sort of the mainstream of battery technology. There's incremental improvements so that the cost is going down and capacity is going up. And, you know, we can just sort of go to the store and every year we're going to have about, you know, 10 to 15 percent more capacity, um, you know, at 10 to 15 percent less cost. And then in the research labs, um, people are working on some very innovative new technologies that, um, you know, pr probably saw this week, um, you know, some batteries that have infinite cycle life. So you can charge them an unlimited number of times and they never, you know, uh, degrade over time. Um, very fast charging times um, and, um, you know, also just higher and higher energy densities. So, and the battery world, I mean, there's just, every application is a little bit different. Like the battery you need for a car versus a one wheel versus a laptop, um, you know, they're all kind of optimized for different things. You know, now companies are starting to build electric aircraft, you know, that's a very demanding application that's leading to certain, um, you know, new technologies and batteries as well. Um, and then there's also the matter of like integrating the batteries into a system. Um, so the battery management system, the software that runs on that, we made the decision to design our own battery management system for this product um, because we knew that would uh, allow us to basically maximize the safety of our product. Um, so it's another uh, sort of challenge that anybody that's building a battery, especially an electric vehicle product where you have a lot of energy at those batteries, um, you know, you, you got to take safety very, very seriously. Um, one question, a quick question is, or can you tell the people here what the actual specs are of the one wheel? So I don't think that was Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, the one wheel can go about uh, 15 to 16 miles an hour, uh, up to seven to eight miles on, a, on charge. Um, goes uphill, downhill. I mean, you can ride up Lombard Street in San Francisco. It's very powerful. It's about two horsepower motor in the hub of the wheel. Um, weighs about 25 pounds. Can handle riders up to, uh, well, we say on the box, 275 pounds, but we've definitely seen some bigger riders than that. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty powerful machine. It's got integrated headlights and taillights, um, as you saw in the video, and you can kind of see now. So I just clicked it on with a little switch on the side, so now the... Um, you know, the, head, the headlight and tail light are engaged. The motor is in the hub of the wheel, and it's all um, actively stabilized using um, gyro and accelerometer sensors. So it's not really like riding a bongo board where you, you're doing the work. It's, it's doing that balancing for you, and you're really just leaning forward to go, leaning back to slow down, and uh, doing the heel-toe balance, which with that wide tire is uh, pretty easy. Go ahead. So... Startups are all about trade-offs, um, and sometimes you have to make some really hard calls. Is there a, a trade-off or, or compromise that you have to make that either you regret now or that you can't turn back on? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we, um, early on, we decided uh, we were going to uh, definitely ship on time, and we were going to, um, you know, just race towards that. And one of the things we decided to do was to, um, you know, build this firmware upgradability that I mentioned from the from the phone into into the um, product. And so when we shipped, the product could only go about eight miles an hour, um, and maybe nine, eight to nine miles an hour, um, and uh, you know, was a lot more wobbly than it is now. Um, you know, because we shipped it on time rather than spending another you know, six months figuring all that stuff out. But because we built the upgradability in, we were able to push that out, like, as an update. Um, and that was, uh, you know, so suddenly people were like, wow, I got, like, a brand new product. It's so much better. I love it. Um, and it really helped build, um, you know, a good good relationship with our customers. So, um, you know, that was one of the things we uh, traded off. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things where, 
um, you know, you have a vision like, oh, I'd like to have, um, you know, this amazing website or whatever. And I'd like to hire this really expensive firm to make it for me. And you're like, well, actually, we can't afford that right now. <laughs> so let's get a good WordPress template and just like get it out the door and, you know, you come back to it later. And, um, you know, now uh, since we're about like a year and a half in, we're sort of revisiting a lot of those things. It's like, okay, now's the time. Like we need to upgrade this system. We need to, um, and, you know, and it, it's also people, you know, it's like you get the people that are the right people to build like the first product. Um, you know, you need some other kinds of people to like grow the business and like, you know, as it, as it matures. So, you know, now we're hiring people that are familiar with not just like turning ideas into products, but, turning small product companies into big product companies. So it's uh, an exciting transition. Uh, I, I wasn't here for your presentation, so I apologize for most of it. But I have uh, two questions. First is, uh, what's the price point on that? So the price point is $1,500, $1,499. Um, and uh, that's basically what it was on our Kickstarter campaign as well. And we've been back ordered since we began. <laughs> so it's a, it, yeah, it's about a five week wait right now if you order on our website. And, and, and your principal competition is the action sports folks. There are products out there that are motorized but are skateboards. Um, yes, I mean, our, our business is sort of a like blue ocean um, where nobody's building this exact thing. Um, there are other electric skateboards, um, other, you know, different kinds of self-balancing vehicles and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, really right now we don't have direct competitors, but we have in, indirect competitors where it's like other, uh, so, you know, like people that are like, oh, I'm going to sell my motorcycle and buy a one wheel, you know, um, and things like that, uh, or, you know, not buy a new bicycle this year or not buy a new snowboard this year and instead get uh, a one wheel. So, we have more indirect competitors at this stage. But if you've got people like Dolby Action Sports, for example, they've got a product about the same price point. It's actually cheaper, and it's got uh, the same same specifications that you're talking about. Great stability. It's got a gyro and all, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's a number of different players in the space, but I think we deliver like a really unique riding experience oh. that uh, oh. at this point it is uh, the main differentiator. Oh. And... I think that's one of the things I, I learned uh, in my design career is that ultimately products are about the experience that they deliver. Um, and, you know, since we deliver something that nobody else does, um, you know, we have a, just a really maniacal fan base. So we have, um, we opened an online forum um, a couple of months ago and there's just like hundreds of people in there uh, just, you know, posting photos of them and videos of new tricks they've developed and all this stuff and, like, you know, asking questions, figuring stuff out. It's a really, really good user community. And so, you know, as we've grown, we need to pull in, um, you know, customer support and community manager people to really, you know, keep, um, like, improving and enhancing the, the user community. Kyle, thank you so much for coming to Monterey cool. Bay. We really appreciate it. Let's everybody give Kyle a round of applause. <laughs> Oh yeah, go for a quick lap. <laughs> we got some food in the background, finish up the pizza and you know. Thank you guys, everybody. So you, you, control, you right. control it by leaning your body. I didn't explain some of the basics. So you lean forward to go forward, lean back to slow down, lean your heel or toe side to make turns. Just like snowboarding. Just like snowboarding, yeah. <laughs> so do you need help? Yeah. <laughs>